Hey guys, what's up? Caleb here, hitting you with another video. I've played a lot of Mega Man. A lot. Like, every game ever made a lot. In fact, there was an event that I did a few years back called Mega May, where I attempted to play through every Mega Man game in one month. It didn't work out, but we almost did. And then I did it the following year, and then that reassured that I played every Mega Man game that's feasible to play. And when I say feasible to play, I'm talking about Japanese phone games that I just don't even have access to and are quite the hassle to even get to work. Doing this event made me realize how many Mega Man games there are. And to my misfortune, I found that there are a lot of really shitty Mega Man games. But of course, there are a ton of good ones as well. In today's video, I'm going to take you through the evolution of Mega Man. This is a video I've been wanting to do for a really long time. I just wasn't really sure how to put it together. But now that I got the proper resources and the motivation, I think it's time. We're going to talk about everything. Every off game and main series game as well. The different sort of universes, if you want to call them, in the different Mega Man games, and ultimately showing you the good and the bad. Let's get to it. So before we get too far into this, I just want to clarify that I don't really consider games with Mega Man as a cameo, like Marvel vs. Capcom, a Mega Man game. Those will be excluded from this video, and I understand that, yeah, Mega Man is in it, but it's not a game that's based around him. This was another thing that was brought up whenever I was doing Mega Maze, that people were asking if I would play games with Mega Man in it, but not necessarily Mega Man games, and those were excluded. So, we will not have those in this video. 1987. Two years after the Nintendo was released, Mega Man hit the NES for the very first time. Other platformers were on the Nintendo at the time, but there was nothing like Mega Man. It blew everything out of the water. There was nothing more satisfying than controlling your blue little robot and destroying other robots and then ultimately defeating an old man. There was no other thing like it. The intricate level experience, the platforming, getting new power-ups, the magnet beam, the hidden thing, which is kind of required. Just. Nintendo game design, stuff like that, but it was awesome. We didn't care about any of that. It was the brand new thing, and it was the best thing that we've ever seen. When you compare it to modern platform games, it's obviously a very clunky game with some pretty rough mechanics. But it's unfair to make those comparisons, 20 games in 2020 versus games that were made in 1987. And, much like every other Nintendo game, these games were not easy. They kicked your ass and made us the gamers we are today. As much fun as we had playing the original Mega Man, what we didn't know is that two years later, Capcom would be releasing the second game of the series, Mega Man 2. Mega Man 2! Fuck yeah! Now, Mega Man 2 was quite the step up from Mega Man 1. Everything about it was better. The music, the weapons, the platforming experience, the utility items, everything. We had more interesting levels, brand new enemies, and just an overall better experience playing the game. Mega Man 2 is actually known as the real Mega Man experience according to what I've seen in like Twitch chat and just everywhere else, people tend to look at Mega Man 2 as, that's that Mega Man game. But the other thing that Mega Man 2 introduced were the three items that you get from beating bosses. You got a platform that rose whenever you hit a wall, you had a platform that just rose, you know, just as is, and then you had a jet item as well. So you could use those to your advantage. In fact, one of the bosses does require it. Um, yeah. But either way, Mega Man 2 was received extremely well, and I believe this is what really made Mega Man a traction. One year later, we get Mega Man 3. And Mega Man 3 introduced Rush, and this was Mega Man's sidekick. 
He took the place of the items that were in Mega Man 2, and he was just a dog that helped out Mega Man in any time in need. And Rush appears continuously throughout the entire series. With Mega Man 3, they introduced a slide, and this was huge. The slide was not only faster movement, but it also helped you evade enemies. And some bosses, you did have to slide, or else you would die. It is a bit tricky, though, because you do have to hit down and then jump in order to slide. So if you want to do, like, some really precise movements with the slide, you kind of have to hit down and jump and then forward really quick to jump and then you got to do it again. It's uh, caused a lot of deaths in speedrunning. But that's not what we're talking about. We're not... Oops. But we're not talking about speedrunning. We're talking about Mega Man and its badassery. And then in 1991, 92, and 94, Mega Man 4, 5, and 6 came out. And they were all for the Nintendo. Other than different small things, different bosses, weapons that we saw in the other Mega Man games, the overall feel and design of Mega Man didn't really change much. All we wanted was just more blue guys shooting robots, and it worked out. But then, in 1995, for the Super Nintendo, we got Mega Man 7. And as I said before, much like the previous Mega Man games, the overall concept and the feel of the game didn't really change a whole lot. Rush was there, you could get an adapter, which is really cool, uh, but other than that, it didn't really change much. But it was a good thing, because we just wanted more of what we had before. Mega Man 7 is kind of biased for people. Some people really hate it, and some people really like it. I, for one, really like it. I think it's one of my favorite classic Mega Man games. Other people don't like it because they think the level design is very poorly made, and I guess it's too hard. I don't know. Get good? But more importantly, this was a brand new feel to how Mega Man was. We got the whole 16-bit experience versus the 8-bit, so we could really see what he looked like. Facial structures, more detail in the armor, etc. And then in 1997, here comes Mega Man 8 for the PlayStation. So now we get a 32-bit experience of the Blue Bomber. Now, I gotta admit, Mega Man 8 is a little whack, and I understand why people don't really like it. The voice acting is pretty bad. But where is Dr. Wily? That's a good question. We may be able to locate another energy emission from the radar room. When we find that media, we'll find Dr. Wally. I'm personally a fan of the game. I, again, I, I understand why people don't really like it, but mechanically, it really got advanced. For starters, in the intro stage, you were given a new weapon called the Mega Ball. This was interesting because it was just a ball that you put in front of you and you kick it. It's a little gimmicky, it's the weakness of the boss at the very end of the level and you have to use it to open up his core and you just destroy it, so... It's not that interesting to use, but it's cool, I guess. But what really set Mega Man 8 apart from the previous games is the shop. Much like Mega Man 7, you did collect bolts and you could visit Auto and you could buy exclusive things, extra lives energy tanks, you buy like an adapter part, stuff like that. Mega Man 8 was a little more advanced. There was a lot of stuff that you could buy, and some of it unlocked as you progressed through the game. There were different buster upgrade parts, different utility, like Super Recover, which would make you restore more life upon energy pickup, faster charge speed, dash speed, stuff like that, and it's just littered with things that only help you. Some of them are really good. <clears throat> the arrow shot, for example. In my opinion, Mega Man 8 did the shop the best. In Mega Man 9, 10, and 11, you never got things nearly as useful as what you found in the shop in Mega Man 8. But before we get to the other games, there is a side game that was released for the Super Nintendo. Oddly enough, in 1998, and it looked really good. And then later ported to Game Boy Advance, and it's just a complete sack of sh**. This game was Rockman and Forte. 
Hence, Rockman and Forte only came out for the Super Famicom, but then again, ported to the Game Boy Advance called Mega Man and Base. Which is the sack of shit I was talking about. This game was hard, and I'm, I mean it. This game is extremely difficult. However, it is interesting because you got to pick what character you wanted to use. You could either use Base or Mega Man. Which is kind of weird because you take him out in Mega Man 7 and he just reappears somehow. Let's play him, so that's cool. Mega Man could do his regular stuff, slide, do charge shots, while Forte was able to do rapid shots in eight directions and he could do a traditional dash, much like you see in Mega Man X. This game did utilize the shot pretty well, much like Mega Man 8. Unfortunately, it didn't really help a whole lot whenever it came to the difficulty of the game. There's a particular level in this game called King 2, which is essentially the Wily stages, is the most brutal boss rush and level design I have ever seen in a Mega Man game to this day. You know how one of those levels that kind of has like a lot of different parts and if you game over, you have to go to the very beginning. Yeah, it's one of those levels. You don't want to game over. You're going to have a bad time. But you probably will, so you're probably going to have a bad time. Overall, this side game is pretty good. It's just extremely difficult, but if you're fine with difficulty, then you should get through this game pretty well. But this was the predecessor to Mega Man 9 which came out much, much later. Mega Man 9 was released in 2008. We had a pretty big drought of classic Mega Man there for a while. However, Mega Man 9 was interesting because it's not like it evolved into a whole new design. It actually kept the 8-bit style. So Mega Man went back to his roots. A lot of people were really accepting of this. It was interesting. We didn't expect Mega Man 9 to be an 8-bit style game, but it was ran on current-gen consoles at the time, which made it more interesting. And I say that because the Nintendo was limited to its hardware. However, with PS3s, Nintendo Wii's, Xbox, that sort of thing, they didn't really have to worry about memory capacity. They could make music that would be more advanced, but still in the 8-bit style, and give the level designs a much more detailed feel. In my opinion, I feel like Mega Man 9 is one of the hardest classic Mega Mans out there, but then again, I'm a little biased as everyone is whenever it comes to classic Mega Man. Then a couple years later, we get Mega Man 10. Again, in the same 8-bit style. People loved it. This game was very well received, and the level designs and the music are pretty legendary, I must say. Then, eight years later, we get Mega Man 11. Just when we thought Mega Man was never to be seen again. This game blew us away. Mega Man 11 was the most mechanically sound Mega Man game ever to be made. Every single button on the controller was used. It introduced mechanics called Speed and Power Gear, which Power Gear would make your buster shots do more damage, while Speed Gear would slow down time. And then Rush Jet and Coil were buttons for themselves, so no more menuing to select Rush. In addition to that, you could also select your weapons with the right joystick, making quick and easy access to any weapon that you desire. Some people including myself, were afraid that a Mega Man game being made in 2018 would be a bit different, in a bad way. However, we were really taken by this. Mega Man 11 had every classic feel of a Mega Man game anyone had to offer. The difficulty was there, the platforming experience, the charging, the sliding, dying to stupid bullshit, that was all there and it felt like we were playing classic Mega Man. It's awesome. So, uh, Capcom, if you could make Mega Man 12 anytime soon, that'd be, that'd be nice, so.
But uh, give me uh, early access. There were other versions of classic Mega Man that were released, uh, mainly on the Game Boy. And these were... Okay. You had Mega Man 1, Dr. Wily's Revenge, and then Mega Man 2, 3, 4, and 5. And these were fun games to kind of pass time. But I must say, it wasn't easy for them to make versions of levels of some of the games into a Game Boy format. Some of those levels were rough. And the music... Oh my god! What the f*** is this? So guys, that wraps it up for the Mega Man Evolution... Hold on. But what about the other Mega Man games? Oh, right. Good point. We didn't even go over Mega Man X. Mega Man X. Mega Man in its peak badassery. This changed platforming and video game design in 1993 for the greater good. This, in my opinion, is the greatest game ever made. Mega Man X was a more technologically advanced version of the classic Mega Man. Armor looking more sleek, more reinforced, more advanced. He was able to get upgrade parts in the levels that he progressed in. Sub-tanks, heart tanks, you name it. It was the greatest game ever made. And in 94 and 95, X2 and 3 came out. When again, it had the same feel. It was just more of what we already loved. Except different parts, obviously different weapons, different bosses, and there's nothing more to say about it than that. I mean, it's just a beautiful experience. Mega Man X3, however, was a bit more advanced as far as the choices of the armors you could have. Unlike the games prior, this game offered an option to upgrade any part of your body upgrades allowing that specific part to have enhanced abilities that it didn't have before. On a regular playthrough, though, you can only choose one and they're in really obscure locations, but hey, it's there. However, what some people may not know is a bit of an Easter egg called the Golden Armor. This is very similar to the well-known Easter eggs in Mega Man X1 and 2, the Hadouken, and the Shoryuken. It's obtained in the same way, however, it's in a weird location in the first Sigma level. It's in a pink capsule, and after you get it, you obtain the Golden Armor, which allows you to have the powers of every chip upgrade simultaneously, allowing you to basically form the most badass version of Mega Man X ever made, ever. Then Mega Man X4 came out, and it was featuring Zero, the character we always thought was a girl, but then we realized he's a badass dude. The Saber. And he's really badass. They offered two selections, X and Zero, and... X4 is just one of those games. Really fun. And then... The X series gets a little weird. Come out with Mega Man X5. In the year 2000, three years after Mega Man X4 was released, Mega Man X5 hit the stores. This game was much different because it featured a really weird timer and just an odd story involving some kind of enigma shot, viruses... I don't know what kind of crazy pills they were on when they were making this game, but yeah, it wasn't the best. I will say though, I'll give credit to the people who designed the music in Mega Man X5 because I do believe it is the best in the entire franchise of Mega Man. X5 was interesting, though, because it was the first Mega Man game to offer more than just one armor. It featured the Falcon armor and the Gaia armor. The Falcon armor was more or less an upgrade of the armor that you could get in the previous game, Mega Man X4, but Gaia armor was a way different take. This was like a tank sort of armor, and it would do things like allow you to walk on spikes. It was very slow, but it could take a lot of damage. Mega Man X5 also features a lot of throwback from previous Mega Man games. You will see it with bosses, different music, uh, and other various things, with level design and such. 
This was because it was supposed to be the last Mega Man X game, and that didn't turn out very well. Because one year later, they came out with Mega Man X6. This is where the crazy pills start happening. This game was perfectly programmed. While this game felt very similar to Mega Man X4 and 5, it was much worse. This game had horrific level design, and it was as if they selected a random kid to design a level of their choosing, i.e. throwing spikes in every place possible. Oh, and crushers. That's fun too. Fortunately, you could crouch in Mega Man X5 as well, so you could avoid things like that, but that's just annoying. X6 also features the two worst bosses ever made in a Mega Man game. In Gate 1, which is Sigma stages, essentially, the final boss of the level is Cancer. You're literally fighting Cancer! It would have extremely obnoxious attack patterns, and while some bosses in video games you feel as if I can do this without getting hit, it almost felt like you were supposed to get hit in this fight. There are two boxes that float around the screen, and they will stop at random intervals, and then the two eyes will pop out, and sometimes it's just not even practical to damage it at all. You just have to wait for the other cycle. The other boss is Gate. Yeah. I don't think I need to talk about him. So, for whatever reason that you decided to beat Mega Man X6, two years later, they came out with more terrible games. One in which I'm <laughs> not going to talk about, but then I'll talk a little bit about Mega Man X8. Mega Man X8 and the other game, for whatever reason, are in 3D environment and is terrible. I don't know why they'd... Capcom, why? Why? The controls, the feel of the game felt... It was so bad. Not to mention, the game looked terrible as well. It just wasn't enjoyable in any way, shape, or form. However, in Mega Man X8, there is one redeeming factor, and that is the ability to switch out armor parts and then mix and match them to your liking. I will say it's a very unfortunate that this feature only exists in one Mega Man X game and never existed in them before. And that's pretty much the only redeeming factor besides the really good music and, well, every Mega Man game has really good music. Much like the classic Mega Man games, they did release them on Game Boy. You had Mega Man Extreme 1 and 2, then the first traditional RPG, Mega Man X Command Mission, which was released on PS2 and GameCube. Not a great RPG, but it's Mega Man X RPG form. Any big fan is going to be happy with that. And then there was Mega Man X Maverick Hunter, which was released on the PSP, which was a remake of the first Mega Man X game. Pretty fun, not super amazing, but it's a good game nonetheless. It's very similar to Mega Man Powered Up, which is also a remake of Mega Man 1 on the PSP. Again, pretty good game, not super great, but good nonetheless. In the midst of all these classic and Mega Man X games, we were also given another universe called Mega Man Legends. This featured a different Mega Man known as Volnut, who typically would walk around without a helmet, revealing his hair. Mega Man Volnut definitely appeared to be more human than he did in the previous games. His interactions, his mannerisms, everything about that, he appeared to be human, just in a suit. These games were definitely fun. It was an open world experience and retained the RPG aspects of the previous games. Getting different armor, weapons, that sort of thing. Upgrades. Going inside of dungeons, you could do that. Unfortunately, Mega Man Legends only made it to two games. There was a third one supposed to come out with the 3DS, but unfortunately was cancelled. So, even to this day, us diehard Mega Man fans are still waiting for that Mega Man Legends 3. 
And as we progress into the year 2000 and onward, we get Game Boy Advanced exclusive games, Mega Man Battle Network. This was an interesting game. Uh, Mega Man wasn't out in the open world, just kind of running and shooting stuff. He was controlled by a character named Lan. In this futuristic environment, what Lan could do was hook his PET up into a computer or any sort of outlet that he could jack into. And he could literally log into the internet with Mega Man and bust viruses in the similar way as a traditional Mega Man experience would. However, this was different because it retained an RPG aspect. You would get random battles on the open world but you would be on tiles in battle. This game utilized cards in which you could make a folder and then put random cards into it, and then in battle, your menu would pop up and you could select the cards. These games are some of my favorite games of all time. As a matter of fact, one of my top three Mega Man games of all time is Mega Man Battle Network 3. That game kicks ass. There's a lot of really good features about these games, being able to switch styles, which is kind of like a different sort of way to play the game, and it would be based on how you play, and the style changes would only enhance your playing style, which was really cool. These games aren't perfect, though. There's a lot of running around, a lot of tedious mini-games that you have to do, but the overall experience is very fun. They made six of these, and number one was the most raw experience of Battle Network. Two was more advanced, three is the best game ever made, four and five are complete garbage, and six, they definitely made a redemption. There was another side Battle Network game for the GameCube called Mega Man Network Transmission, and this kind of followed the same principle as a classic Mega Man. You never played as LAN, you only played as Mega Man, and you were constantly in the internet, and it definitely felt like a traditional Mega Man game, although you did use cards in the same fashion. And then alongside these other games being released for Game Boy Advance, we also got the introduction to Mega Man Zero. These games are supposed to take place after what happened in the Mega Man X series, and what Zero did onward. While this isn't technically Mega Man, it's still in the Mega Man universe, and you're playing as Zero, so it's still really cool. These games, however, are not only hard, but extremely fast, and have some of the best controls out of any handheld game I've ever played. All four of them are fairly similar, except for two and on, is where you can select different suits that allow you to get different abilities, different stats, etc. And then a year after Mega Man Zero 4 was released, they released Mega Man ZX. Now this is a massive upgrade, and it's called ZX because Mega Man Zero and the Spirit of X are like forming together, and it's really cool. It feels and plays much similar to Mega Man Zero games, however, these games are open world and the map is completely flat. This game mechanically is very sound, however, getting around and finding your way is a massive pain in the ass, and the map just doesn't make any sense at all. And then they released Mega Man ZX Advent, which was the sequel, and I'm not going to talk about it because it's not a good game. So yeah, uh, guys, once again, thank you so much for watching. Oh. Wait, you forgot about the Mega Man Star Force series. Oh. Mega Man Star Force was a very weird take on the Battle Network series. It looked as if it evolved, but it was a bit weird. In 2006 through 2008, each year they came out with a Mega Man Star Force game, 1, 2, and 3. These games felt and played similarly to Mega Man Battle Network games, however, this didn't make the cut, unfortunately. These games possessed pretty much all the elements that a Battle Network game would, except the battle was different. Instead of selecting over tiles and an overworld sort of view, it was behind Mega Man 
and you kind of moved side to side, and you couldn't move up or anything. It was less mechanically advanced. Weird. This game's redeeming features are just really cool, overdone transformations, and some of the chips that you select are really cool, but overall, not a strong game. So, overall, the evolution of Mega Man, I feel like, started really stable, went up, the X-Series kind of peaked, you know, up there with Battle Network, and then got a little more advanced with the Mega Man Zero games, and then pfft, Star Force came out, and uh, that's uh, where it all fell down. But everybody's biased. Everybody has their favorite games of the franchise. Speaking of that, there are several side games, like Mega Man Power Battles 1 and 2, which is a short side scroller game that was only officially released in arcades in Japan. There's Mega Man Battle and Chase, which is, again, was only a Jap Japanese game that was released, and it was a racing game. It was a bit weird, but whatever. Mega Man Wily Wars, which was for the Sega Genesis, and that was interesting. You would go through and select weapons for each level and pick and choose what you wanted. Then you have Street Fighter Cross Mega Man, which is literally Street Fighter in a Mega Man game. Really, really good. It was released in 2012 and initially was supposed to be a fan game, but Capcom endorsed it and then made it official Capcom Mega Man title. Then you have uh, Mega Man Powered Up, like I mentioned before, Maverick Hunter X, Mega Man Soccer, <laughs> Mega Man Game Gear, oh, Mega Man DOS? And other games I didn't mention, which are primarily Japanese mobile games, which I haven't played and I never will, because I probably won't ever have access to them. But it's interesting to see how our little blue bomber has evolved and made changes throughout the years with being in different video games, different universes, but still keeping the same concept, the little blue bomber we all know and love. And thank you so much for watching today's video. Make sure to comment, like, subscribe, you know the drill. You guys do me a favor, have a great morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you happen to be, and I will catch you in the next video. Thanks for watching.